are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the programme where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And joining me today is Azid Gungar, CEO of Quidditch Group. Hello, how are you? Very well, Stephen. Trust you had a good journey in? It was perfect, actually, not too far. Good. And good to see you back for your second show. Thank you. Thanks for you having me. You survived the first well. And joining Azid from France is Trevor Leggett, founder of Leggett Immobilier, French property experts, via Zoom. Welcome to you, Trevor. Yeah, hi, Stephen. Good to be on the show. Okay, Azid, we're going to get straight on with your first question, and it's this. I'm interested in buying a freehold investment of perhaps a small residential block. I've read that already there have been changes in the law regarding ground rents and wonder how these changes could possibly change what has previously been a pretty safe, long-term and risk-free investment, which I think we all agree that freeholds have been in the past, haven't they? Well, yeah, when you think about who was investing in freehold, it was pension funds where they, were, they had that trickle money coming in, you know, for, for a very long period of time. I call that watching paint dry. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but you know what, if you've got billions to invest and you can make, you know, three or four percent, two or three percent even for 25, 30 years. And safely. And safely. Yeah. Why would you not? So, but they have, you know, maybe it's worth me uh, kind of uh, giving a bit of an update around the changes that's happened around uh, leasehold um, changes. So in 2022, so January, February, Every time the law changed uh, for leaseholds. So in effect right now, if you have a leasehold that's coming up like a brand new flat uh, coming up, the leases that are going to be granted now is going to be 999 years. So no more of this 125 years and renewable after that. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is within those leases, there will be a zero pound worth of ground rent. So it's going to be there, it's going to be peppercorn, get a nominal value of it but there will be no actual ground rent. Now, let me just interrupt you there. For, for, our, for our viewers that perhaps haven't had our experience over the years of leaseholds, yes. you better explain that expression, peppercorn. So peppercorn, as I understand it, was uh, back in the days, back in maybe 100 years ago, where it was an actual peppercorn that was given as a transfer of value to get this lease. So it literally eased the actual peppercorn that you give. So effectively, it was a gesture. It was a gesture. It was a mm. gesture to say, you know, a bit like back in the day, we do stamps. So you put a stamp as a as a nominal value. Yeah. Even before that, and then it was sign over it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So so it was a yeah, it was a transfer of value, and you kind of almost tokenized it by a by a peppercorn. So great. We're a long way away from this now. Okay, but we're going back. To but it. we're going back to it now. <laughs> we're going back to it in the sense that you know it's going to be a zero value on ground rent, uh, peppercorn uh, transfer of value. 999 years. Um, the other thing to consider is if you're an existing leaseholder right now, that hasn't, that's not changed yet for you. We expect, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm expected, uh, look, reading the, the kind of the bill that was uh, passed uh, in January, that they are going to come to the existing leases at some point as well. And we expect the same thing, 99 year leases to get scrapped to 999 years. And the idea being that, you know, the leaseholder will not have to pay this marriage value, which is what most people have to spend a lot of money once it reaches 80 years and the lease starts decreasing. So I'm just imagining how that would work, perhaps perhaps by way of a, a, a right to automatically renew your lease to a certain certain level yep. without without premium, but perhaps with qualifications, perhaps you've had to be in there 10 years or 20 years or something like uh, that, perhaps. So, so we don't, I don't know the exact detail around how long you've had to op uh, own it, but certainly the, the, the mechanism of, of implementation will be, let's say the lease is dropping down to 80 odd years, mm -hmm. typically leaseholder will start looking at renewing before it hits mm -hmm. that 80 year mark. Well, for the mortgage. Uh, for the mortgage yeah. purposes, because mm -hmm. otherwise you won't get any, you know, oh, you have a lot less mortgage availability for you. Yeah. So if that's the case, uh, then for um, existing leaseholder, once the law does change, we expect it then to have a renewal and the lease will go from 80 years to 999 years. Right. Peppercorn rent uh, being transferred, no marriage value. Okay. And I'm actually sitting on two or three of them where I'm not going to uh, renew the lease now. I'm okay. going to wait it out until the law changes and then renew the lease. Right. I mean, I, I suppose the, the, the interesting point uh, of all this is, yep, lovely. 
all good for the tenant. I'm just thinking about the landlord or the freeholder, let's put it that way. Yes. Um, it will become less attractive yep. to, to hold a freehold. Um, is that perhaps just going to uh, uh, encourage, if you like, uh, occupier ownership of the freeholds? Is that going to is that going to be encouraged? I can't I can't see where the value is for mm -hmm. a freeholder. You're going to have a lot of liabilities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with very little advantage. Yeah, so so actually the, the advantage of trickle money that we, we spoke about that goes away because there's no ground rent to be paid. I think from an advantage perspective for developers, I think there's two things that we need to consider. One, and I think that's the, that's the kicker. So if you're going to buy a block, when we're going to consider buying blocks, we're going to look at where we can put extra layers on. Mm -hmm. So let's say you buy a purpose built with three floors. But actually, you know, in the area, you know, in the planning rules, you will be able to get planning permission to add two more uh, stories onto that block yeah. that's worth buying so you buy the freehold you then uh, apply for planning and then potentially you can get planning permission or on, on so there's some planning um, would you get PD that rights. would you get that under these new uh, development rights yeah there's some PD rights that exactly yeah. does that so it allows yeah. you to apply uh, with minimal you know but then again you end up a lot of the time with full planning mm. but the idea is there is some notional um, planning rights the uh, development rights has been passed if you can get that done then i think buying a freehold with the idea of putting extra floors in that makes a lot of sense because then you can just crystallize yourselves uh, your your profit that way i mean we mustn't forget that the the the, the purpose of freehold and leasehold was actually for the benefit of all concerned, to keep control of the management of the building, its aesthetics, its mm -hmm. safety, its maintenance, and all the rest of it. And I, I'm always very nervous when, when tenants say, we want to take over the block management. I mean, it is so complex these days with building regulations, safety regulations, and all the rest of it. I, ju I just wonder where the professional freeholders and landlords are, go are going to come from. Well, the second, so the second, I guess, um, advantage or opportunity that as I see it with this new change will be for those professional block management companies. Imagine you're a block management company, you're already running, say, 50 or 100 units. For you, it probably makes sense to go and buy these decreasing value freehold investment, mm -hmm. and then you then bring them under your remit to manage and carve out a profit between management, you know, uh, service yeah. charge, charge, costs, and then you, 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 you take a margin of profit on that. Okay. But that, again, it's not going to be for everybody. Certainly, we would not be venturing into this kind of uh, realms, but, you know, for block management companies, I can see a value there for them. It cer certainly seems to me that um, b big city developments and uh, management and uh, ownership of these freeholds is going to certainly have a changing pace, isn't it? I think when you when, when I talk about service charges, you know, uh, one of the things that scares me to death is it's always going to go one way, up. Don't start me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Aziz, so thank you very much for that. That's a that's a really good answer. Thank you so much, uh, Trevor. On with your question. Please, can you give us a general overview to the current market conditions in France at this time? We understand that there is an election coming up and wonder if this will have any impact or effect on the property market across France. Well, I mean, we don't even know if Macron's going to be candidate when we're recording this. So um, he's, he's, he's playing games at the moment and uh, I think it's quite clever, frankly. Mm -hmm. he's, he's going to announce his candidate probably, you know, a week before the first round or something like that. Um, and he's, he's way ahead in the polls at the moment, unless he does something drastically wrong or something happens. I can't imagine quite how he can mess this up, but I mean, if he does, then he's a fool. And frankly, I think he's done a pretty stellar job over the last, you know, the last five, five years has been very good for France. The economy's flying. I mean, he's been very good for business. You can't please everybody. Unfortunately, the Yellow Jackets didn't like it. And yeah, he hasn't been very good about speeding and People have got fed up with having speed cameras everywhere, so they've shown their disgruntlement and by destroying them all, um, which is quite nice. I quite like the way the French do that. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, it, it's been five years where I think France has actually changed the country. Young French people are far more dynamic than they were before, much more entrepreneurial than they have been in the past, and, uh, and they've still managed to retain all of their 
family values and uh, the, you know children are still polite people always say good morning hello good afternoon and you know how are you and uh, I, I think you know when you see the difference now in in the, the generally young people's manners from here to the UK it's startling but you know I, so I don't think really Macron's done a lot wrong. I mean, the French moan about him because they moan about everyone. They've never had a leader they like ever. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. Hopefully he'll be re-elected in my view because uh, none of the other candidates look like they've got a clue. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll find out by the end of April, won't we? So. so what will be the impact on the housing market if that does happen, i.e., you know, Macron gets back in. Is, is, is there any particular uh, um, part of his ethos that will affect the market, do you think? It probably continues the same way it is. I mean, it will charge on a bit, but um, I mean, interest rates are obviously what will slow it. I mean, if interest rates go up, it will slow down. There's a lot of room in the French housing market, other than the hot spots like, you know, Bordeaux, La Rochelle and Lyon and, uh, you know, the major, the French cities, Paris, obviously. Um, where prices are already very high, but we've seen them stabilise during COVID. They haven't really gone up in those areas. And then the provincial towns have seen a huge increase during COVID, um, literally 30 40% increase over the two years in some provincial towns. Uh, that's where the big difference is. We're starting to see price increases in the countryside due to the lack of availability of, and, the, and the increased demand. From mainly French buyers, um, you know, I, I, I can't see it slowing down. It's, the average house price in the country now is about fifteen hundred quid a square meter. It was about twelve, thirteen hundred. Most cities, like small provincial towns, were between a thousand, thousand five hundred. They're at least two thousand, two thousand five hundred now, and in some areas reaching three thousand square meter, which is still well below places in almost every town in South East England or Belgium, or Holland, and Germany, I mean, prices are through the roof. So France is actually quite good value still, and will remain good value, even if prices increase for the next 10 years, it will still be good value. I see, and okay, and if you're set on a particular area of France, have you got any tips for people wanting to buy in a particular area? Are there specialist areas? Where, where a particular agent will focus on and, uh, and, and give you advantageous terms for buying in that area or uh, have some tips for you to, to make sure you can get the property that you really want? I think they need to keep their eye on the ball themselves because they can't just rely on their agent to do it for them because the agents are so busy visiting, listing and whatever. You, they, they, you know, when property comes on, they need to be, they need to be, obviously they need to be, on the mailing list for the agencies, but they need to be there looking themselves every day. Um, and when something they like comes up, they need to jump on it, just as everyone else is. I mean, we just bought a house the other day for my brother. And, uh, you know, we, we, he was looking for something. It was exactly what he was looking for. It didn't even go to market. And that's what's happening. A lot of stuff's not even going to market. Um, I mean, you know, I hear in it all the time, stuff literally that the, the property's not even getting published online. Yeah, it does, it's true, because people have got a handful of buyers that are ready to go. I mean, myself, I'm looking for another property to develop at the moment on the coast, and it, it, it's, it's impossible. I couldn't, there's no way I could manage to find what I'm looking for on my own, impossible. And I'm an agent, and I need to work with other agents to do it, because they're on the ground, and if something, gets to, if something comes in, it will be gone before I even get to see it, so... No, I, it, it was a bit like this, the market in 2005, six in France. Okay. And then obviously, the, you know, Lehman Brothers 2008 financial crisis hit it. We haven't been back where we were in 2005 until now. We are now definitely back where we were in 2005, 2006. And I would say, and stop. OK, thank you very much, Trevor. That's great. Well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break. You are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with Azid Gunga and Trevor Leggett. Um, Azid, your second question. 
I am a long leasehold owner of an apartment in central London. The freeholder is trying to introduce various changes to the maintenance and general upkeep of the building, which I and my co-owners object to. Despite our objections, the freeholder has instructed the managing agent to implement these charges. And as owners, um, within the service charge, we pay the, the managing agent's fees. My question is, who is the managing agent responsible to legally? Is it ourselves or the freeholders? After all, it is the leaseholders who are paying their fees. Well, um, good luck with that one, Azid. I, I, th I think I've had that question all, all through my life in London, I think, and it's a constant argument with managing agents who get terribly embarrassed when they try yes. and answer that question. And I'm sure you're going to explain why. Yes, I, th I think the challenge is, is who's appointing a management agent? Let's start there first. So really and truly is the freeholder. So the freeholder will go out to market and say, I've got a block of 250 flats. Um, I want to have this managed uh, so that, you know, and let's not forget the freeholder's responsibility is to make sure that the building is safe, the structure is safe, all the kind of the fire regs, all the kind of uh, the building regs that control uh, are adhered to. If it's a grade two listed building, grade one listed building, you add more complexity to the thing. So first and foremost, the freeholder, let's hope that, you know, is generally trying to do exactly that, which is to keep the upkeep of that building as best as he can. To do that, then they go to market. So they will go and say, okay, you know, who wants to tender for this uh, managing agent, management agent um, of this block? And then somebody will win. Now, you have a dichotomy of kind of uh, interest. Here. You've got the freeholder appointing the managing agent. Then at the back of it, you've got a service, uh, service charge payers, really, the leaseholders who are paying. So you, you so the question is a very valid question. Who is answering to whom? In my humble opinion, I think service uh, you, um, managing agents tend to answer to freeholders because if they don't do, well, let's call it what it is, what they want to do, they want the job. <laughs> exactly. They want, a they want the job to be able to service that 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 work, but also think about the term after the term is finished, and you've, if you've not played well with a freeholder, what does a freeholder do? Mm. Go and look for another management agent. Mm. So there is that kind of almost conflict of interest a little bit on that side. Then on the other side, rightly so, the managing agent are being paid by the service charge uh, payers. You'd think they would have a say, but they have a say to a certain extent. They can ask questions. They can ask for extra quotes that a job's been uh, quoted for. They can have those kind of um, kind of uh, come back to the managing agent. But ultimately, if there is a problem with cladding, for example, the managing agent gets some surveyors to come out and then get a cost get a cost for that work get a section 20, which is for a big uh, cost of um, re uh, renovation and refurbishment, then there's not much else that the leaseholders uh, or the service charge payers can do because ultimately they are doing what's best for the building. Mm. Well, the, I, I mean, the accounting procedures are, are, are fairly strict now, aren't they? Yes. they? They have to be fairly transparent. And yeah. um, I think if my understanding is right, it would be wrong for any managing agent to start making profits on things like in, in insurance policies and things like that. I think they're at least obliged to specify any commissions they take, are they not? I'm not I yeah, I, I think that's a grey area. I think I think there is they have to they have to show what you know if, if there's any kickback that they're getting from insurance companies or even suppliers and stuff like that, they have to show that. Um, but I guess like anything though. No. I mean in the case of a conflict uh, between let's say a group of tenants and, and a managing agent who's acting, shall we say, under the instructions of a freeholder. I mean, where, where would you go to dispute that? Would it, would it be a county court matter? Would it be a tribunal matter? Or That's a tough one. Um, lucky enough, I've never had to deal with that. But my guess would be you'd start with the, uh, the managing agent to begin with, the freeholder next. And then maybe some form of arbitrage that you mm. might um, look to, to to get set up because you go into court, it, nobody wins apart from the lawyers. No. So you know, and then you add more layers of, of, of cost to that to the argument. So yes, I mean it's quite interesting. We were doing a, 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 a program the other day, and um, we, we we did have a lawyer on, and um, she was saying actually that actually, and I, I know I'm a been a magistrate for many years but we don't do property matters in the magistrates court but in the county court although they will attempt to deal with property matters and have to do so by, by practice 
actually not many of the judges are that au fait with the latest re you know regulations and, and and updates of law so it's it, it can be very costly and very frustrating to go to law over these things yeah. and i just wonder with all the government reforms that are supposed to be going on around uh, property you, you'd think there might be an opening really for a proper sort of arbitration system a very simple one yeah that would be it would be cost effective. I think that is a gap in, I think, from government regulation perspective. In my opinion, I think there is something that's lacking there and, and having more formalized uh, way of, you know, raising a concern about a managing agent and then having a process to follow. I, I can't say that I know of any that's, no. you know. No, it's a shame. But I think, again, while we have such a constant merry-go-round of housing ministers who never seem to stay mm. in the job very long. I think it's one of those jobs you get on the way up or on the way down, isn't it? You, it, it it's not, it has no longevity to it. Um, and until you get one that has an understanding of the market and that's in office for some time, mm. Mm -hmm. we're not going to really see very meaningful changes, are we, I don't think. Sadly not. I think ministers will come in and the biggest priority is to build more, build more, build more. So leaseholds and a leasehold dispute is not really going to be on there. I'm not even sure they do that particularly well. <laughs> well. We're missing 200,000 a year, so yeah, probably you'd argue that, you know. That's not there we well. Okay, Azid, thank you very much for that one. Um, Trevor, we're going to move on to your um, second uh, qu question now, and it's this. I'm looking to move to France uh, for the change in lifestyle, but I'm worried about the infrastructure in terms of road, rail, but particularly things like internet. Please, can you tell me how France fares in terms of these uh, provision of services? Well, I mean, again, France has got fiber optic everywhere. I mean, basically all the villages have had it put in everywhere. 4G coverage is fantastic. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's very, very good. I mean, in England, I hate to say it, you know, even at my home in West London, I don't get a signal on every network. And I have to stand in the middle of my garden to be able to talk on the phone. And, and I had to put a booster in eventually on the chimney to get a signal. So I think France is everything, in, all infrastructure in France, we can safely say is better, whether it's road, rail, internet, mobile it's all better than it is in the uk i mean it, it's a we all know that the french and the japanese put a huge onus on infrastructure and they invest an awful lot of state money into it which is something unfortunately in the uk we've left it to private enterprise and they've done a job of it I, 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 natural fact, I find it irritating now and i think a lot of people that live here would find the same is that when you go to other countries where the infrastructure is not as good, it, it, it is quite annoying because you get used to a level of expectancy that things work in certain places and, you know, trains turn up on time. You expect it um, and occasionally you get a strike, it does happen. Um, and then you don't get any trains at all. But I mean, we hadn't had any for a while and we had some last week. Um, we may have some more in the future, but normally they'll just cripple the country until they get what they want and then we cave in and give it to them and then everything's good again. OK, well, that's all we have time for in today's show. So I'm going to say a big thank you to Azid Gungar, CEO of Quiddity Group, and of course, Trevor Leggett via Zoom, founder of Leggett Immobilier, French property experts. Thank you both very much for your answers. Thank you very much for coming into the studio. Thank you, Trevor, for operating your Zoom so efficiently. And um, I look forward to seeing all our viewers again next time on Property Question Time.